here's a segment from a recent Gun Talk Radio episode. You can listen to all the Gun Talk Radio podcasts however you tune in, or check out guntalk.com for more. A lot of things going on, and as you have heard the last couple of weeks here, man, there's some exciting things happening in the world of gun rights, some stories that are breaking, that one uh, out of the CDC where the folks uh, from Reload had the story, Stephen Katowski, who had him on, talking about the CDC actually colluded with gun control groups, facilitated by the White House, so that the CDC ended up taking off of its website information about defensive gun uses. Because the gun control people, the gun ban people said, look, when you have that information up about people using guns successfully in self-defense, it makes it harder for us to get gun control or gun bans passed. So we need to get rid of the facts. What they're really saying is we need to be able to control the narrative, which is a kinder way of saying we need to be able to hoodwink the public so they will accept gun control. I'll talk about that because that this is simply ongoing. It's been going on for half a century, if not more. The half a century is the part that I know about because I've been here for that long working on gun control and, and, and gun rights and, and, and all the rest of it. Let's do a quick flashback to where we were 50 years ago because you can't know where you are and you most certainly can't know where you're going until you know where you have been. And I guess... One of the benefits of getting older is having perspective, having lived through a lot of things that other people are either don't know about or are just discovering or, un- unfortunately, are not taking advantage of. They don't know what went before, and sometimes they reinvent the wheel or they try to, and I see this all the time, they try techniques, they try things that we, who've been around a long time, know don't work. When, we, when I tell people, don't do that, it won't work, they think I'm guessing. And what I'm really saying is, we already did that. It did not work. Or if I say, here's what does work, it's not like I'm guessing or thinking, ah, this will probably work. No, we have tried this, we have a track record, and we know what does work. Unfortunately, Fortunately, I'll get to this in a second, I would offer that most of the things that people who call themselves Second Amendment supporters, most of the things they do are either ineffective or counterproductive. I'll fill you in on what I mean by that in a second. That probably, unfortunately, includes you because we've all been there. But let's flash back 50 years ago, 50 years ago. Um, pretty much the guns that we talked about were bolt rifles, bolt action rifles, lever actions, a few semi-autos. You know, I mean, there was the Winchester 100, you know, the Remington 742, Browning. Uh, ARs were rarely seen 50 years ago. I mean, they were around, but they rarely, rarely seen. Um, in your bolt action rifle, pretty much hunting guns, with the exception of bench rest rifles now, I understand that. A rifle that shot two inches was considered just fine. You know, uh, if you got a rifle that would shoot one-inch groups, that was exceptional. In gun rights, the Gun Control Act of 1968 was brand new. Before that, before 1968, there's no such thing as a federal firearms license, an FFL. There were no waiting periods. (sighs) We had the NRA ILA, but... It was just getting started. This was right, 50 years ago, was right after the assassinations of JFK, Bobby Kennedy, Martin Luther King, the 1968 riots. You may have to go to a history book to see that. It it was a different time. And the reality was the media was just as much in the tank then as they are now for gun control, for gun bans. And the Gun Control Act of 1968, which was called the Dodd Bill, Chris Dodd, no, Tom Dodd, Chris Dodd's dad, uh, authored that. If you really want something interesting, go 
look up Thomas Dodd and his role in World War II. Interesting. Find out some interesting things there in Germany. Uh, so Gun Control Act of 1968 gave us gun stores, gave us FFLs, gave us 4473s, gave us lots and lots of restrictions. And about that time, 50 years ago, 1973, a fellow who had retired out of the military bought a cattle ranch in Paulden, Arizona. His name was Jeff Cooper. He transformed self-defense with handguns, created, you know, well, along with some others, but at the time created a new discipline of self-defense with handguns. Before that, it's pretty much the FBI crouch, one-handed shooting, revolvers shooting from a crouch. Jeff Cooper made the 1911 useful. I mean, there were a lot of 1911s around, but it made it useful for self-defense and really popularized the idea of using a semi-automatic pistol for self-protection, for self-defense, because it was all revolvers before that. Pretty interesting at the time. There were no, remember, there were no Glocks. There were no polymer plastic pistols 50 years ago. Jack O'Connor and Elmer Keith were still riding, but they were kind of at the end of their careers. They were the, the big hunting riders of the time. O'Connor riding for Outdoor Life. And he's you know, considered to be the, the fellow who popularized the 270 Winchester cartridge, which is not a bad thing, still an excellent cartridge, and still actually, interestingly enough, I would say better than the 6.5 Creedmoor. Out to 600 yards, a little bit later today, we'll talk to somebody who just tested that theory out with the 270 on long range shooting, we'll see what he ended up with. Um, there was no Glock 50 years ago, no Kimber, no Springfield Armory, the gun maker, no Tika. Add another 50 different gun makers to that. None of them were around then. And as I look back a little bit, we're kind of looking at the retrospective before we look forward, uh, flashing back to 1995, March 1995. That's the start of this radio show, Gun Talk Radio. Tom Gresham's Gun Talk started in March of 1995. The idea came from a cocktail party conversation that I had with Alan Gottlieb from the Second Amendment Foundation. I was doing TV at the time. I was also, I mean, I've been writing for magazines all my life, <laughs> seemed like it. I started writing for publication uh, when I was 18. Uh, I was taking pictures for national magazines when I was 13. That was because of my dad uh, illustrating his articles. But 1995, I'm having this conversation with Alan, and he says, you ever done radio? I said, no, I've never been on the radio in my life. Never been a guest, never done anything. He said, well, you ought to do radio. Five weeks later, I'm doing radio. I was just so dumb, I didn't know anything about it. I was dumb enough to go ahead and try it, because if I'd known anything, I never would have done it. I had no idea how, how hard it was going to be. But remember the time. Rush Limbaugh had been on the air just a few years. He energized, I don't know if he started, but he energized talk radio, changed it. Remember, at the time, you got to go back, this was really pre-internet. Now, there was CompuServe, AOL, but no real internet to speak of. Talk radio was an end run around the media that wouldn't treat us fairly. Never has, never will. So if we wanted to get our message out, we had to find a way around them. And talk radio did exactly that. And then he said, okay, well, why not talk radio about guns? And since I already had 25 years of experience writing about guns and gun rights, and everything from sports appeal to guns and ammo to you know, gun magazines, hunting magazines, I said, well, yeah, I'll give it a shot. I'll, I'll give it 13 weeks. Actually, I, said, I think I said I'll give it six weeks, but <laughs> we'll see. So here we are, uh, almost 28 years later. In 1995, we were one year later than the Clinton gun ban of 1994, the so-called assault weapon ban, which did nothing. Even the government studies afterwards, when it sunsetted, said, yeah, it didn't do anything. 
A bunch of Republicans who voted for this gun ban got a pass. The Democrats took it on the chin. Actually, Bill Clinton in his State of the Union address in January of 95 said they lost, the Democrats lost control of Congress because they voted for gun control. The Republicans got a pass. If you were there, you remember they passed this gun ban, but there was a provision in it called a sunset provision, which said that it automatically sunsets in 10 years. It, it goes away. Where did that come from? You may not like it, but what I'm told is that it came from the NRA. They were able to slip that in. And because, look, this thing was going to pass. It was greased on rails. It was going to happen. We were going to get this gun ban. There's no stopping it. So the NRA said, well, let's slip this thing in there and see what we can do. The great irony of the whole thing is that the very act of them voting for the gun ban cost the Democrats control of Congress. They had had control of Congress for 40 years, 4-0, 40 years. And then they lost control of Congress. And then as a result of that, they couldn't renew because they thought, oh, yeah, put a sunset in there. It's fine. You know, in 10 years, we'll still have control of Congress. We'll just renew it. But they had lost control of Congress because they voted for gun control and it didn't renew. And the Clinton gun ban, the so-called assault weapon ban, went away after 10 years. Now, we're fighting the same battle today. But the difference is we're winning big time. We're winning huge. Uh, let's see. 50 years ago. Let's see. We were, well, not 50 years ago, but uh, 1987, Florida passed shall issue concealed carry. What was that, 35 years ago now? Wow. The anti-gunners and the media dubbed Florida the gunshine state because they had been called the sunshine state. They called for national boycotts of Florida because they're going to let people, regular old Americans, carry guns for self-defense. Blood will run in the streets. Every fender bender will turn into a shootout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same old thing, right? And then concealed carry shall issue concealed carry marched across the country, state after state. Some states like Texas, it took a lot of time. They finally had to get rid of their governor, Ann Richard, before they could get it passed and signed into law. Now, where are we today? Look at this. We have half the states have permitless carry, also called constitutional carry. You don't have to have a permit at all. You don't have to say, mother, may I, to be able to protect yourself and your family. We're making huge progress, huge progress. Uh, in the process of doing this show over the last almost 28 years now, well, let me go back. Why did I want to do this? Having written about guns and gun rights, having covered this, and kind of looking at the landscape, I thought what we needed was a nationwide voice of reason. Not somebody who's screaming up and jumping up and down, being a lunatic for gun rights, because unfortunately some of our people are a bit of lunatics. And what that means is they become ineffective. If you're not moving public opinion, you're not effective. Now, yes, we are winning right now in lawsuits and courts, and that's entirely uh, appropriate and very important. But the gun ban folks have figured out long ago, you got to move public opinion. Hence, Bloomberg's millions and millions of dollars spent, creation, the creation of this phony journalistic group, The Trace, which is a gun ban group created by Bloomberg. But then The Trace goes out and works with media outlets to plant these stories. Why would they do that? It's not that they just like to have stories that are favorable to them. It's that they change the language. They change what people, with their quotes, know to be true. The very term assault weapon was created by Josh Sugarman, who said, the public doesn't know the difference between full automatic and semi-automatic, and we can use that confusion to get them to think that they're voting against machine guns. So they created Saturday Night Special created assault weapon. They created the term junk guns. Now we have ghost guns. They're pretty good at that. Why do they do that? They do it to change public opinion. So I created Gun Talk Radio to change public opinion. I wanted people, if they're going down the, the road, this is before podcasting, remember, 
and they're hitting the scan button or trying different stations. They land on this, then after a while they go, boy, those guys sound like they're having fun. Those people sound like us. They, they, I would like to be with them. And we normalized gun ownership. So that was kind of the whole idea behind gun talk. Our mission statement, might as well go big, right, was simply this. The mission statement of gun talk, gun talk media, gun talk radio, all of it, is to permanently change the way guns and gun owners are viewed in America. Boom, there it is. We're working on it. Uh, in the course of all this, oh, look, I'm a writer. I'm, I'm a language guy. I'm a word guy. And I believe in the power of words. I've seen the power of words. And so I try to change the language. And so I can come up with different phrases, different words, different ways of approaching things. I think they're original with me. Who knows? Some of them may be borrowed from somebody else. You never know. Uh, I think I was the first person to come up with a good guy with a gun. The only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is with a good guy with a gun. Now, Wayne LaPierre picked it up and made it popular and famous. I came up with the gun ban lobby, the gun ban industry. Instead of calling them gun control, like I'm gun ban, because that's what they do. I came up with, I said, look, let's stop calling these high capacity magazines. They're not. They're standard capacity. I started talking about standard capacity magazines. I see that used all over the place. That's great. I want people to borrow this stuff and use it because it's effective. The right words are weapons in all this thing. Where are we now? There are 25 million ARs out there. Most of them, many of them are super accurate. Polymer handguns are standard. A bolt gun that shoots only an inch isn't really that impressive these days. Half the states have constitutional carry. And the big one... Where are we now? Bruin, 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 changing the landscape. 